Good. Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Morning Report. Um, you'll notice immediately the massive vacuum that is left by the absence of the other R. Worry not. Reza is in the hospital and is coming momentarily. Um, a special thanks to everyone who has their video on. It makes my day brighter. So Samuel, hello. Tanya, good to see you again. Madalina, thank you. Oh, and Natasha, amazing. I know Kevin's gonna flip his, there we go, I knew it. I called it, I called it. Uh, we, have a, um, we have a special um, presenter today. Um, Catherine, who um, well, I think um, some of you met yesterday on Virtual Morning Report, has a case hey. for us today. So, hi, so just let me see why I'm not being able to start my video is saying failing to fail to start the video camera. Oh, no. But that's I have- only, That's the only one. kind of failure in VMR. There is no other kind of failure. <laughs> <laughs> Give no, me one you... minute. I have another camera. I will just grab it. Yeah, sounds good. No rush at all. No rush at all. Um, yesterday was quite the doozy of the case. Um, Kevin, can I pick on you for a sec? There's a lot of people here who weren't here yesterday. You want to tell them what, what journey you took us down yesterday? Yeah, we had a mid-30s, otherwise healthy female who really was only recently diagnosed with hypothyroidism and then had a remote history of viral myocarditis, if I remember. Um, mm -hmm. She presented with AMS and was febrile. Her labs were pretty wacky. She was hyperkalemic, hyponatremic. Um, and eventually everything was pointing towards infection and parainfluenza came back positive. But we checked a AM cortisol and it was low, which led down the train that ultimately found to be in adrenal insufficiency. And then we scanned her head with the MRI and she had an empty cella that we think was likely from Sheehan syndrome um, from her pregnancy four years ago. Crazy, right? So it, was crazy, it was a crazy case. You did all that in 30 minutes. And you know, right above you on my screen is, in my opinion, one of the world's experts in these conditions, Tiago, who is a, who you, um, who will decline that, but like every expert. Tiago, <laughs> hello. Hi, Robbie. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you, my friend. Kevin really took us for a tailspin yesterday. And I think um, one thing that stood out to me um, with that case is the presence of hyperkalemia in the, in the presence of secondary adrenal sufficiency. That was, it had an ultimately probably had um, another explanation, but, um, but that was really, really, um, really quite a spin. Can you share with us how you, how you think about Sheehan syndrome? Like, what does that mean to you as an endocrinologist? Sure. So uh, for the hyperkalemia, it doesn't make sense for me as well. I don't know the reason. So it's something I'll need to study because yes, yeah, just expected if you have primary adrenal insufficiency and then the ACTH would be high. Um, but if the ACTH was normal or low, then it's secondary uh, adrenal insufficiency. And then you expect aldosterone to be normal and then the potassium should be normal. So I don't know. Uh, please uh, let me know if anyone has the answer for a hyperkalemia in a secondary adrenal insufficiency. I'm very curious about it. If I may, real quick, I, I don't, I can pull it up, but we checked aldosterone and it was actually low. Oh, and the ACTH was, was normal was also or low? Low. Oh, so... It's, it's, I don't know how to explain the aldosterone being low in this scenario. Um, can she have, I don't know, I'm just thinking, both primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency? It's possible. It's possible. And, you know, if, why? Because she has, she had primary hypothyroidism, and the most common cause for primary adrenal insufficiency is autoimmune disorder. So, I don't know, I have to study, but uh, both primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency is very unlikely, but possible. Uh, and it's interesting to know that aldosterone is low. So what's going on? Uh, the, the adrenal image was normal? Yeah, from what I remember, we did a CT abdomen pelvis and there was no findings. Okay. 
very interesting. I studied more about it. And uh, regarding the Sheehan syndrome, it's called. It's often. It's always postpartum, and uh, it's the apoplexia of pituitary uh, because of low uh, blood supply. So it often happens after a very uh, serious situation during the the, the pregnant during the, the the delivery. Uh, and so you you have a lack of blood in the pituitary and then you have this problem. Why doesn't it happen with people who are not pregnant or after delivery? Because they don't have a large pituitary. So once you're pregnant, your pituitary is very large and the blood supply uh, needs to be increased because of the prolactin. So that's the moment in which you can have problem with blood supply and then the apoplexia and then the, all the Sheehan syndrome in which you have a, a pituitary failure. And I see Reza there, so it's time to stop. <laughs> oh, yes, um, I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, that's ne necessarily true, my friend. I think that your teaching is and we hope to learn more and more over many many years. Thank you for that great overview, Prof. Rez. Prof. Le Rez is going to crush the discussion today, but is struggling with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yes, really well. Actually. Everything is in French here, so I, I'm just like clicking buttons. Wait, where are you? I'm in, in Geneva, Switzerland, and um, logged on Zoom, but everything is in French and doing my best. Amazing, you're crushing it. You know, we have a, a special case presenter today. Um, her name is Catherine, and she is joining us for the second time, I believe, on Virtual Morning Report. Catherine, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So hi, I'm Catherine. I'm a physician from Brazil. I graduated about a year and a half ago, and I got a position at Mayo. I was for a research position. Uh, I was supposed to come May last year, but due to the pandemic, things had to be postponed. So I came in December, and during last year, I worked at the emergency department. We can do that in Brazil, like right after graduation. Mm. So I worked for a year, came here, and so here I am working with basic research and applying for internal medicine this year. Very mm -hmm. excited and very happy to be here. I, I miss, I actually have to say, it's been amazing uh, to work here with research, but I have to say I miss my patients and I miss the clinical reasoning. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, you know, I'll make a, I'm, I'll make a pitch for San Francisco, um, but today's not the day. Look, it's very, very cloudy. Yeah. But as Simone will tell you, it's a wonderful, beautiful city to hang out with. See oh, someone I, I love it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Have you ever been? Yes. Amazing. All right. Well, I hope I hope you make it. I hope you make it a place where you consider to stay permanently. Um, my I see my dear friend Andrew Lechner on the call, who's probably busy. Um, <laughs> who's probably busy taking care of his um, young child, but um, can also vouch for the awesomeness of this place. Yeah. All right, Catherine, take it true, away. True and true. Yes, he's here. I thought you might be like far away from your computer. Good morning, my friend. Hope you're doing hey, well. Thanks, you too. All right, Catherine, take it away, please. So let's start. This is a 53-year-old woman who presented with subjective fevers, increasing exertional shortness of breath and fatigue for approximately 10 days. She didn't have any cough and she reported temperatures of 99 Fahrenheit over the last few days. Okay, this is fantastic, Catherine. Um, thank you for, for joining us. I don't even know where the exclamation point is on the keyboard. Everything is backwards here. Look, I can't even look straight. Oh, here, okay. <laughs> so um, this is actually really, it's, it's a nice start. Maybe I'll kick us off and then um, see what Robbie has to add or how he would um, you know, continue with this case. But the, the subject of fevers, you know, you have to assume that it's real until proven otherwise. So already I'm translating the problem into subacute inflammation. The next question becomes, do we have any clues to where this inflammation is orig originating? And here we have dyspnea. So of course, dyspnea has a broad differential diagnosis but I'm not interested in the broad DDX. I'm interested in inflammatory dyspnea. Now, Catherine may give us more information that changes what questions we ask or where we zoom in on, but now I'm thinking inflammatory dyspnea 
And I go down thinking about infection first and foremost. If infection gets ruled out, then we can think about less common causes or causes of fever or inflammation that have more of an indolent course like cancers and autoimmune diseases. So maybe actually I can pass the mic to Robbie. I, I know that there's a, we're gonna get a lot more information. Robbie, when you think of inflammatory dyspnea, how do you think about that in terms of the DDX? Oh, I love it. You know, I think my instinct now these days is to make sure that I'm not being fooled because I think um, it's tempting to say that dyspnea is a complaint that people refer to in their thorax. And the first thing is to be like, whoa, 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 you, your, your dyspnea may be extra thoracic. So how could you have no problems in your heart and lungs and have uh, inflammation? You could have a sinister process somewhere else and have metabolic acidosis. So you have inflammation from your leg or from your belly and your dyspnea is actually metabolic acidosis. The other distractor is of course, uh, inflammatory anemia. And the other distractor is fever with hyperthyroidism, none of which have to do with the actual chest as well. But then, you know, like after being, making sure you're not fooled and you're not led astray, you've got to be practical. And practical is here, play this game with me. If you name all the cardiac causes of inflammation, endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis, and if you want to get real fancy, coronary vasculitis, um, all those in some total multiplied by 100 don't even come close to the incidence of pneumoitis or pneumonia. So when there is inflammation and it's in the chest, it's much more likely to be in the lungs. And um, only on VMR do we entertain endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis. And again, if you want to get really, really, really fancy, coronary vasculitis um, early on. The truth is this is a pneumonia until proven otherwise, atypical or, or a community acquired. And then if we prove otherwise, it's only because it's a rare case in virtual morning report. In real life, this is a pretty good case for it. All right, Catherine, back to you. Okay, so let's go to her past medical history because it's very important. She had B cell ALL diagnosed eight, 11 months prior to this presentation, which was treated with four cycles of a hyper CVAD. Um, then she received a match related donor BMT. Uh, four months prior to this presentation, her course was complicated by AKI due, due to rituximab toxicity but then she recovered renal function after they suspended the drug. And she had a persistent pancytopenia after her BMT. Her meds include acyclovir, penicillin VK, levaquin, fosaconazole, pentamidin, all, all of that for antimicrobial prophylaxis, and also tacrolimus for GVHD prophylaxis. Did I go on for her vitals? Okay, so on a, uh, upon admission, her vitals were temperature 99, um, heart rate 90, BP 100 over 60, respiratory rate 22, and TATs were 92. Um, she had physical examination where as notable for conjunctival paler um, and lung auscultation had crackles over the left lung, left lung base and bronchial sounds over the left upper lung. Awesome. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is it a good place for us to chat, Catherine? You think? Um, I think so. Or do you want me no. to go on to the labs? No, no. This is perfect. So, what you know, what I can do is I can um, I reflect on the medical history and leave the uh, foreground with the exam uh, for Reza to dissect. And you know, when you're when you're trying to solve inflammation, you really have to answer four questions, and those are the four Ws. Who, which is, describes the pertinent risk factors of the patient. What, which describes the summary of the clinical syndrome. Where, which reflects on the importance of epidemiology in the uh, range of possible infections, soil exposure, water exposure, CMV status, and of course, when. The time course of the syndrome is crucial 
to solving it. So the four W's are who, what, when, where, who, what, when, and where. And here I'm asking Reza to clarify the what, which is the exam. And I will tell you the who. And the who is an immunosuppressed host. And what that does is immunosuppressed hosts is it takes the possibilities of infection and expands them. So could this patient have strep pneumo pneumonia? Absolutely. Is the patient more or less likely to have strep pneumo pneumonia now that she's in immunosuppressed? The answer is more likely, not less. What happens in immunosuppressed hosts is the range of common illnesses becomes more severe and infections that don't affect immunocompromised hosts come into play. So it's, that's a really, really important point. So the spotlight doesn't move away from the things we always entertain. In fact, it strengthens on those, but also gets bigger. But this isn't in just any old immunosuppressed host. This is a patient who's re received a bone marrow transplant. And there are complications that result uniquely from bone marrow transplant that affect the lungs beyond infection. And that's importantly graft versus host disease, which she is, um, uh, which she, she is getting prophylaxis against. There are some less common complications of bone marrow transplant on the lungs and the heart in the form of cardiomyopathy or venoocclusive disease, which are very rare, but worth you just knowing that, that they exist if this journey takes us all the way until the end. The priority I would say is to now consider routine infections, but also to consider things that might cause bone marrow disease and um, uh, lung disease. And the one infection that unfortunately plagues immunocompromised hosts and should be strongly entertained in addition to the routine stuff is cytomegalovirus. Unfortunately, CMV is a big source of morbidity and mortality in, in, in bone marrow transplant patients and commonly presents as a um, lung syndrome, GI syndrome, bone marrow syndrome, fever of unknown origin syndrome, and even, even brain syndrome. So here, um, we got to focus on the, we got to study the landscape, but as soon as somebody with pancytopenia who's in the suppressed, who has shortness of breath, you have to worry about CMV. All right, Reza, I'll give the mic to you. I think that is poetry, my friend. And here, when you, when you examine someone with a fever, you want to know, is there any clues that can point to a specific site of pathology? Be cautious when you interpret the vital signs in someone who's immunocompromised, because they might not be able to mount the typical systemic inflammatory response syndrome in someone who is immunocompetent. So that temperature of 99 is not reassuring. And when you look at the respiratory rate with the oxygen saturation, with the background of the crackles that Catherine had auscultated, you local ISO alone. There's a lot of data. I'd be very surprised if imaging doesn't show an abnormality in the lung. And we'll talk about that in a second. The conjunctival pallor is just consistent with the hemoglobin less than 10. If you look at the palms and you have palmar crease pallor, then you can say the hemoglobin is less than six. But we know that this patient has like chronic pancytopenia which also affects our differential diagnosis for possible infections. I do not think the anemia is what's causing this patient's shortness of breath. With the hypoxemia, the tachypnea in the crackles, my focus is the lungs. I haven't ruled out a multi-systemic process, but I've prioritized lung pathology. Here in the lungs, when you hear crackles, what are crackles? It's either fluid, it's pus, it's red blood cells, it's lung that has collapsed, atelectasis, or interstitial lung disease, five causes. Again, we've prioritized inflammation, so we're gonna be leading with infectious category, but other stuff can be at play. And just very quickly, when I'm interpreting the abnormal lung exam, which I think we're gonna see some form of ground glass opacity, if not a consolidation. I'm thinking about our patient. Patients who are, have autoimmune diseases or patients with cancer. I ask the question, can this be a relapse of the cancer? Can it be a, comp a direct complication of the drugs, like cytotoxicity? Can it be because the patient's immunosuppressed and now has an opportunistic infection? And in this, specific case, you have to entertain graft versus host disease, like Robbie said, which can involve the lung, the GI tract, and the skin. 
So what are the next steps? Well, of course we want to know, does this disease involve any other organs? So we're going to want liver chemistry tests, the renal function test, renal panel, the CBC, and I would get imaging. Um, and you can start with the chest x-ray, though I feel like a CT scan will give us much better um, view of the parenchyma and might, be able, might allow us to actually prioritize amongst some of the causes we've discussed, whether infectious or graft versus host. So that's, that's what I would do next. Um, I'd pass the mic back to my dear friend and colleague, Catherine. You see, y'all, you see why he's won so many awards. Look at that. Look at all those awards behind him, paintings. And I don't know if those are actually... Um... The trick to having a lot of awards behind you is go to someone else's office. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, things like light up. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the labs. Um, she had a hemoglobin of 6.8, leukocytes of 1.2 with 0.82 neutrophils, platelets of 32,000, sodium was 136, K 4.5, mag was 1.8, BUN 25, AST 44, ALT 41, uh, creatinine 1.2. Her tacrolimus level was 3.2, uh, which was low. We expect it to be between 5 and 15. Uh, of course, she has a, she had a very uh, comprehensive infectious workup done with uh, blood sent for fungal and fungal and bacterial culture, uh, aspergillus antigen, sputum was sent for gram stain, fungal smear, fungal and bacterial culture, urine was sent for legionella and strep antigens, and she had a chest CT, which showed a new consolidation in the left lower lung with a patchy consolidation in the left upper lung. If you want to comment on that. Absolutely. Can you, um, Catherine, just repeat some of the, the studies she had sent, like what's pending and, and maybe what has returned? I don't think we caught all of it. On the infectious workup? Th that's right, the infectious okay. workup. Okay, so blood culture, fungal and bacterial, aspergillus antigen, sputum also, was also sent for gram stain, fungal smear, fungal and bacterial culture. Urine was sent for Legionella and strep antigens. Uh, and that was it for now. And these are all pending. We don't know what the results are just yet at this point. Is that correct? At this point, we don't. We don't. OK, fantastic. So actually, since I, I did a, quite a bit of speaking the previous one, I'm just going to pass the mic to, to Robbie to marry the labs with the imaging, because I think that's the way you discuss this aliquot. No, I know. I think I'm just latch on to what you said about the alveolar infiltrates and they could be blood, pus, water, cells, so on and so forth. And in an immunosuppressed host, you have to prioritize pus. But while, we, while we're going to focus on that in a minute, I think the other possibility not to miss is the possibility of blood. And that blood would be that the patient is so thrombocytopenic that she's intermittently bleeding into her lungs. But that, of course, is a diagnosis of exclusion. And in this patient, you're going to go down the pus route, knowing that the final glance would be at water in the form of cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And again, I'll emphasize the one non-cardiogenic cause of pulmonary edema in a bone marrow transplant patient is pulmonary venal occlusive disease, which it sounds very rare. But in this patient, when, you, when you're around oncology folks, um, like I get the privilege of, they'll think about this diagnosis in a case like this, at least put it in their notes. Um, but the focus is on pus. And so what can cause a pneumonia in an immunosuppressed host? It's really so many different viruses. And I will just add the ones that we especially consider in immunocompromised hosts. And that is severe adenovirus, cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster virus are, are ones that are often entertained. Um, there's no unique bacteria that we think about, um, especially in immunocompromised hosts. Um, there's TB, Pseudomonas, um, and based on epidemiology, but no specific bacteria. The fungal category is the game changer, where PJP comes into the uh, calculus and less commonly cryptococcus. Uh, all the endemic mycoses are considerations based on epidemiology, but the molds are always a consideration, and aspergillus is a big, big, big player, and this has its new core. Um, and then there's some parasitic infections to consider, and specifically uh, the possibility of reactivation of strongyloides, which causes 
uh, a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage type picture in these in these patients. So what, how is it, if you keep it simple, you're like, I, I know my causes of pneumonia really well in, an, in a well patient. What do I need to add an immunocompromised patient? I just have a quick short list in front of you without it being organized. It's really adenovirus, CMV, VZV, PJP, molds, and Strongy. Um, and those would be those would be the ones that I'd be thinking about. And some of them are captured by the tests that uh, Catherine outlined, but some of them are not. Um, and so that's the pulmonary picture. And I'll, I'll pass the mic to us to see if any thoughts to add on to that, or if there's any clues from the CBC or any other labs. No, I, I think that's beautiful. Very systematic and organized. And I would be interested in what her CBC was prior to this presentation to see if there's like a delta. Um, but of course, this patient is immunocompromised. And I think the best way to get an answer is to get sputum and send it for the various studies. Maybe you might require to be required to do a BAL to get like a closer look in the alveoli to see what infection might be at play. But at the same time, sending the blood CMV uh, so if that comes back positive, then the next step is to make sure that that CMV is actually causing uh, tissue pathology so you can end up with that diagnosis. But at stage one, um, I think, Catherine, you've done a terrific job of, of sending the, the study. So we wait back to see what studies result and if we need to be more invasive in our workup. As far as treatment, it, it should be interesting here, like what you decided to do for this patient. They are immunocompromised. As Robbie said, they're at risk of typical infections. And then the spotlight just broadens to include atypical infections. If the patient was like an extremist or, you know, uh, appeared quite ill, then you have to entertain empirically starting some, some medications for PJP, for CMV. But at this moment, the patient at least appears quite stable and you have time to try to get to an answer. So I, I would be interested to know, Catherine, did you guys start treatment for typical pneumonia as you work this patient up for more of the atypical causes? Yeah, so she was started on cefepim, two grams and azithromycin for three days and admitted to the hospital, of course. Uh, and also right after admission, she had a bone marrow biopsy to check for, for recurrence. Um, and she had a normal cellular bone marrow with morphological, mor morphologically normal tree lineage hematopoiesis. Uh, and she also had a bronchoscopy with bronchovial bronchovialar lavage. And uh, that was sent for a fungal culture, grand stain, acid fast smear, legionella culture, uh, fungal smear, mycobacterial culture, aspergillus, nocardia. Uh, influenza, RSV, PCR, histoplasma, blastomyces, pneumocystis, viral culture, and cell count and differential. I babbled away last time. You're up, my friend. Awesome. Um, very tough case, for sure. And um, we have a very broad workup. And the question is, what, what is the test characteristic of each of these infections that we're investigating? So for example, in someone who is not synthesizing, like let's say they're not synthesizing immunoglobulins, your serologic test will not be that helpful. We actually recently have a case that I highly recommend you listen to on our Patreon, case 61. I won't spoil the final diagnosis, but that was a setting where um, serology wasn't that helpful in, in the patient. The question is, um, what else can we do here? And, and Catherine, at this juncture of the case, do you have all these results back and they're all negative? All negative. All negative. And, and you did send the um, CMV PCR? Oh yeah, that too. It was that sent. was also normal. So to, to be honest, the question is, and probably maybe you and I can dance together on this one. Um, one, is there an infection that we didn't capture on our first round on evaluating infectious causes? Or are we dealing with a non-infectious process, specifically graft versus host disease? The issue, when I, when I even say those terms, how many patients of, with graft versus host disease have I taken care of? 
as zero, as zero. So it's not an area that I feel super comfortable with. It's an area where I know enough to ask the question. Then I would look up on up to date. I imagine you would rule out all infectious etiologies. I imagine the CT scan would give you specific findings that may prioritize it. I imagine maybe the BAL might give you some clues to, to the diagnosis. But Roy, maybe I can pass the mic back to you and see uh, where you are and how you would proceed in workup. Yeah, you know, I think that at the end of the day, that when you get closer and closer to um, being more comfortable that an infection isn't at play, you have to move towards a tissue, basically. And you know, what's really interesting is um, when you're trying to when you're trying to pursue infections, your gold standard is tissue as well. But in the world of autoimmunity and in the world of cancer, you often often require tissue. So there's some um, autoimmune diseases that are very good serological diagnoses. But just yesterday, we had a patient in the emergency room who needed a biopsy for giant cell arteritis. Not one, one or two months ago, we needed to biopsy somebody for the possibility of glomerular nephritis. For inflammatory myositis, we needed a biopsy. So in cases where you're not lucky enough to pick up an infection through non-invasive means, and not lucky enough to pick up a simple autoimmune disease, which can be picked up with an ANA, RF, uh, SSA, SSB, you often need tissue. And so here, the question is, can you get an answer without tissue? And I'm not seeing any, you know, this, this is a very broad infectious workup, so it needs combing through thoroughly. For example, could this be adenovirus and have we missed that? So you need a glance at that. You need to also glance at the possibility that there's parvovirus uh, potentially involved causing bone marrow and lung issues. But if you're really scrutinizing the infection workup and you're like, it's negative, the truth is that with, with an ANA and an RF not being revealing and unlikely to be revealing because they don't seem to align with the presentation in this case, you need tissue. And trying to predict what the tissue will show is really hard. And it either, I think, prioritizes, show, prioritizes an atypical recurrence uh, of the disease, or as you said, the possibility of graft versus host disease. So um, yeah, I would probably comb through very closely what infections are being sent and wouldn't be surprised if there's some sneaky viruses that evaded us. But if that's not the case, um, <laughs> graft versus host disease or PVOD are, um, are getting warmer and warmer and warmer. What's that big smile about? I was laughing at sneaky. <laughs> it was perfect adjective. All right, Catherine, have you snuck a virus in, or is this something else? No. So yeah, she she had she had adenovirus PCR sent to, and it was negative. So at this point, this patient is deteriorating. She was sent to the ICU with high flow nasal cannula with uh, FiO two of sixty percent. She had worsening respiratory status. They repeated the CT, even a CT angio to assess for PE. It was negative, but she had had increased consolidation in the left lung, and now she also had in the right lung. Um, so it was more widespread. Um, they assessed also for fluid overload. Echo was unremarkable. She was unresponsive to furosemide. Uh, they even consider idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or some vasculitis, but Anna and Anka were negative. Um, so she was started on high dose IV solumedrol uh, and then win, win thereafter. And uh, she was stable for about a week, but still requiring uh, high flow oxygen. But eventually she was intubated and and like it, during this, all of that happening, she had two bronchoscopies with BAL, uh, everything sent for culture and infectious workup again, everything came back negative. Um, so we are, we are approaching the diagnosis. If you want to do any other comments on that. No, I think, uh, I think it's it's very this is a very challenging case and very unfortunate in its complexity and I think um I think your my suspicion is your only hope is you can resend things and catch something that you missed on your initial workup as Reza said the tests are imperfect or you um or you get another piece of tissue 
Um, and um, I'm struggling to think of anything that I would be confident about. Um, yeah, I'm, I can't wait to learn from you. Um, I'll pass the mic to Reza to see what concluding thoughts he has. So generally, um, everyone usually gets better with steroids initially. So your steroids is a diagnostic test. It's a diagnostic maneuver in your patient. That patient that you think has GCA who gets steroids and is not better, it's not GCA. The person who you think has acute interstitial nephritis early on doesn't get better, it's not AIF. So the question is like, of course we all know infections can uh, worsen. Oh, take care, Mylon. Have fun. Take care. We all know infections will worsen with immunosuppression, right? Any type of infection. So that has to be on our DDX or something we've missed. The question becomes graft versus host disease still. What do we expect with immunosuppression? And here's where I would look up. You know, you have to be honest with, with your knowledge base. I would want to know, do I expect all patients with graft versus host disease to improve and improve rapidly? If so, then that would become less on my DDX. So if uh, Fernand is in the, in the chat, he can type in what the expected response is in patients with graft versus host disease with IV solumedrol, if, if he expects a response. And that's the only way I could put probability on what I'm, so I'm thinking either an infection that we missed first round and has worsened with immunosuppression, whether it's viral, fungal, or atypical, and graft versus host disease, uh, especially if Fernanda is saying it should improve its first line. So then that makes that less likely. It would make me want to search for an infection even more so. Yeah, Red, I'm just, to you, my friend. Oh, I, Robbie, please. Well, you know, it's funny when you, when you sit back and you like hear somebody else thinking through it and I, I didn't study the course of the steroids and I think that's very helpful to put it away. And if, if we're calling it refractory to steroids, um, there's one, one set of diagnoses that you should consider. I don't think it's the answer in this case because it doesn't explain the pancytopenia, but on, in, in a small subset of patients after a lung transplant, we talked about pulmonary veno occlusive disease, how they can be fibrosis of the veins, but unfortunately a subset of patients rare get fibrosis of the small airways and they get what's called bronchiolitis obliterans. Um, and so if the pancytopenia is not neatly tucked in and unexplained in this case, that's also something that your biopsy will pick up. And I think the theme, just to analyze the theme that Reza and I seem to be in, is when you, when you, have, an, when you have a syndrome that's refractory to steroids with no clear answer, the theme may be fibrosis. And fibrosis graft versus host disease is a fibrotic disease, and fibrosis of the veins or fibrosis of the airways. But it's I don't know. I'm saying that as pure, pure speculation on the fly, but I think that's that's the conversation I think we're having. Robbie, that is so beautiful because recently I had a patient with AIN, and when I spoke with my friend, he said AIN initially will improve, but if you wait to treat AIN, you get fibrosis, and then it's refractory, and only biopsy will show that fib fibrosis. That it, so it's sort of end stage disease. Brilliant point. Okay, so let's go to our, let's get to the diagnosis presumably. Um, she had a, someone asked about biopsy and bronchoscopy. So at this point we had the results and it showed focal diffuse alveolar damage and immature fibrosis, uh, no pathogen, like not, nothing um, infectious. Uh, so at this point, uh, she was also receiving gencyclovir vancomycin, meropenem, she was like all covered with broad spectrum uh, antibiotics. And um, they, so they, they consider, they consider, sorry, they consider the possibility of idiopathic pulmonary syndrome, which is kind of a spectrum of breath versus host disease. And she was started on stress dose, steroids, and neck and etanercept. But unfortunately, she she just deteriorated. Eventually, she was transitioned to comfort care and passed away a few days later. Wow. Um, Catherine, very sad case. Thank you for sharing and thank you for presenting it so expertly. So was the working hypothesis some like variant of graft versus host disease? Was that your the final DX for you guys? 
Yes, so it's, uh, it's called idiopathic pneumonia syndrome. It, it happens uh, after bone marrow transplant. Um, and it is uh, a spectrum, so because it, it only affects the lungs and it includes everything you, you said before, like alveolar damage, fibrosis, and it's very, it has like 86% mortality. The only treatment we have is a tenorcept, a TNF alpha inhibitor, but still it, it is very hard for patients to recover from that. Great, a quick cognitive autopsy for me and then I'll pass the mic to Robbie. Like when I found, when we found ourselves in that steroid non-responsive state, you're either not dealing with, you know, an, an inflammatory non-infectious process. So you're either dealing with an infection you're either dealing, and this is the category I didn't consider, with a steroid responsive inflammatory process that has been chronic, leading to fibrosis, and now becoming refractory to therapy. So I, I think for me, this was really helpful in that um, adding like an additional bucket to that steroid refractory and that you can't exclude like a non-infectious inflammatory process because maybe it's long standing. Um, Robbie? Yeah, you know, I think it's absolutely humbling um, uh, to expand your. Um, I think this case is really illustrative of the power of clinical reasoning, but how it is uh, always incomplete in the absence of knowledge deficits. So, with a lot of thinking and analogical reasoning, you can come to the conclusion that this is some sort of um, fibro inflammatory condition. And um, I haven't done it yet, but if you Google um, the uh, probably Google bone marrow transplant fibroinflammatory and spend some time, you probably would arrive at learning at this. And so I'd encourage you all this. I think this case in Reza and I thinking out loud shows you that um, you can think through a lot with analyzing very thoughtfully the data that you have at hand. But if you have a knowledge gap and you haven't heard or learned about something, um, you will not get to the answer, but the power of reasoning will allow you to formulate an easily Googleable question. Because if you take all this and you put it in Google, you'll get nothing. But if you study it and practice and practice and practice, I think you can come to a more thoughtful question. And I think that's where we're at. We were like, what kind of fibrosis conditions could affect the lungs? And there are many times where we get it, where we, didn't, we don't get it spot on and we were very far. Today, I think we were very close, but I at least, um, had never heard of this syndrome before. And so if you, if you, um, if you, and I say this because if this happens to you in real life, where you're like, oh shoot, like I actually got the diagnosis wrong. What I encourage you to do is retrace your steps. How far did your clinical reasoning take you? And, and study, what is the gap between my clinical reasoning and the answer? And what is the knowledge gap? Those are two completely separate parallel things that we do all the time. And for me, um, I'm going to spend some time learning about idiopathic pneumonia syndrome. Catherine, what did you take away from this? So I have to say this patient is not mine. Um, I, I wrote about it, but I, I, I didn't see this patient. Um, but I also didn't know about this diagnosis before. And actually it's not that uncommon. Apparently I put it on the chat. It, it happens between 4 to 12% of each uh, CT patient recipients. So it is a diagnosis that like if you have a patient post bone marrow transplant with uh, signs and symptoms of pneumonia and you're getting a uh, negative workup, you have to put it on your differential because it's, uh, it's a very bad diagnosis. And maybe if um, you start a treatment sooner, maybe the TNF alpha inhibitor sooner, maybe the patient can have a better prognosis, but yeah. I think that's absolutely superb and a great, great summary of today. And I, I commend you for being able to present somebody you hadn't seen so um, effortlessly, especially with so many tests that you had to uh, tell us about today. Really, really marvelous job. Thank you. All right, Kiara, take us home. Uh, thank you so much, Karen, for this amazing case. I enjoyed and learned a lot. Um, so we start with a female who, with a past medical history of a ALL who received a bone marrow, bone marrow transplant. So with that, we have our WHO, which is an immunosuppressed patient. So we have, we started with uh, a fever, chief concern. And for fever, we have to 
to assume that it is real unless it is proven otherwise. That's what Reza told us. So figure can be translated into subacute information in this case. And first we have to rule out infection. And if after we rule out infection, we then have to think about cancer or some autoimmune diseases. Uh, however, sometimes when we have an immunocompromised patient, vital signs may not be helpful because they won't translate maybe that, that there is a severe disease because for example, they won't, they won't present with fever maybe. Then we have that this patient presented with dyspnea. And with dyspnea, with dyspnea we can think like in a, an organized approach, maybe this can be a thoracic uh, disease or extra thoracic disease. And with dyspnea, dyspnea, we have to think first about pneumonia first, that, uh, and then we can think about cardiac inflammation or infection causes because pneumonia is a very much a very more common a very more common cause. Then um, Ravi told us that when we have inflammation, we have to think about the four Ws. First, we we have to think about who is this patient, and with that, we have to consider the risk factors. In this case, in this case, this was a immunocompromised patient. So when we have an immunocompromised patient, this, this can lead to more infections or even more severe infections. Then we have our second W is what? And with what we have to answer with the clinical syndrome. Then the where is the epidemiology, so some risk factors or, or epidemiology to concern some other like bags. And when, so we have to consider that time course. In this case, this was like a subacute uh, time course. Then when we have an immunocompromised patient, and if this is a cancer patient, like in this case, we have to consider maybe this is a relapse or maybe this is a drug toxicity because this patient is receiving many drugs for the, the cancer and for the bone marrow transplant. Or maybe this is an opportunistic infection like cytomegalovirus. And we also have to consider graft versus host like uh, in this case, because this patient received a transplant and graft versus host can be present in many, many organs and systems. Then we had that this patient had, had crackles in her, in her lungs. So we can prioritize that this patient, so in crackles we have to prioritize pus, like thinking about infections, but, and of course, because this is an immunocompromised patient. So some possible etiologies for uh, an immunocompromised patient with crackles, we have to think about virus like adenovirus, parvovirus, cytomegalovirus, or zoster. Then some um, bacteria, in, in this case TB, but there are non-specific bacteria that can we can think about. Many bacteria can cause this. Also pseudomonas, pneumocystis, some endemic mycosis, aspergillus, moles are very common in immunocompromised patients, mucor and strong. Uh, then we have more information, a lot of information, but some many confusing, confusing because we had many negatives. But when we have a severe immunocompromised patient, we and they and this patient has serologic test negative. Maybe we, we cannot rule out infections or we can, maybe these tests are not 100% specific because many immunocompromised patients have serologic tests negative because they cannot produce immunoglobulins. So if we, how we can rule out infections, we can have PCR testing and we must take tissue samples. And after that, we can think about graft versus host disease. Uh, finally, an amazing pearl that I will take forever is that one, steroids can be used as a diagnostic tool for inflammation. However, if we are not treating an inflammation and this is a real infection, steroids can worsen the, the course of the disease. But there is one exception that of the rule that when we have a chronic inflammatory process uh, and we and that done response to steroids is that because this this process have became refractory and this is what happened with this patient. Thank you so much, Catherine. I learned so, so, so much. And I will read also about this disease. Good, thank you. Terrific job. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity.